Hi there, it's Flippy here again. What I wanted to do and what I've been thinking of recently is there's one webcomic um, and one study in the 1970s always reaches out to me when I think about how best to understand addiction. But first I'd like to explain the comic I'm about to show you is by Stuart McMillan. Um, all props to him. This is his work. I don't own it or have any rights to it. I just believe it is the best way of understanding addiction from people who have done scientific studies on it compared to myself having been an addict. And what I'd like to present to you now is simply known as Rat Park. Our understanding of addiction, our understanding of drugs, is built on many assumptions. One of the biggest assumptions is that drugs are seductively addictive, with drug addiction caused by a mere exposure to these bewitching substances. In the 1950s and 1960s, the scientific proof of chemical addiction came from rat experiments. The rats were surgically connected to self-injection apparatus, put into isolated cages, and taught to self-administer drugs by pressing the lever inside the cage. The researchers watched on as the caged rats self-injected powerful psychoactive drugs. Dominated by their habits, some of the rats would choose drug injections in preference to food and water, killing themselves through neglect. The implications were bleak and worrying. It seemed that drugs were capable of ruinous harm to individual self-control. And if drugs were available to the people as freely as they were to the lab rats, mass addiction and social crisis would be the certain result. Professor Bruce Alexander thought differently. He wondered how much insight into human addiction could be gathered by studying rats. He wondered how much insight could be gathered by studying rats in solitary confinement. Descended from wild Norway rats, albino lab rats remained curious, gregarious, social creatures, so the sensory deprivation of the classical drug experiments must have been akin to torture. Alexander wondered if he too would retreat into a drugged haze, if locked in a box and given no other option. In 1977, Professor Alexander assembled a team of Simon Fraser University researchers, Bruce Alexander, Barry Bryerstein, Robert Combs, Patricia Haraway. The team decided to repeat the classical rat drug studies, but with some crucial differences. Their experiment would test the power of drug addiction using morphine, a close cousin to the notoriously irresistible life-destroying heroin. The team ventured bravely into the dark domain of addiction, wondering what they would find. The researchers took over a large room within the university, and began preparing a carefully controlled experiment. In one part of the room, they placed an array of standard wire mesh cages, The metal cage walls would isolate the rats, preventing them from touching or seeing each other. In the other part of the room, the researchers constructed a large plywood enclosure. Measuring 8 by 8 meters squared, the enclosure had over 200 times the area of standard laboratory cages. The researchers painted the walls with scenes of woodlands and natural environments. They covered the floor with fragrant cedar shavings for the rats to nest in, and scattered boxes and cans for the rats to hide and play in. Importantly, the researchers gave the rats other rats to play, fight, mate, and interact with. Satisfied they had created a rodent paradise, they named the enclosure Rat Park, and began experimenting on the rats. The Seduction Experiment 32 rats, 16 male, 16 female, were randomly assigned into isolated cages or colony housing in Rat Park. The researchers gave both groups of rats the choice of two liquids and measured their intake. Days 1 to 3, the team learned that both groups of rats loved sugary fluids, a sucrose syrup, and hated bitter fluids, an undrugged quinine solution. The researchers also tested both groups' tastes for the bitter sweetness of a non-drugged quinine sucrose solution. Days 4 to 8. Now understanding the rats' taste buds, the researchers began to try and seduce the rats into drinking morphine. Wondering if the rats would avoid the drug because of the bitter taste, the team sweetened the deal. 
adding various ratios of sugar to tempt the rats into drinking the morphine. The researchers step down the mixtures every five days, gradually transforming the bitter narcotic fluid into a sweeter, but nevertheless drugged brew. Alexander and the team keenly observed how much the rats would tolerate this bad taste in order to experience the effects of the morphine drug. Would the two groups of rats consume the drug at different rates? Days 9 to 13. At first, all rats avoided the extremely bitter morphine sugar solutions. But as the researchers lowered the morphine, days 14 to 18, the rats began to experiment with sweeter fluids. The isolated cage rats began drinking the morphine far earlier than the rat park rats, and in much higher volumes. Cage consumption was up 19 times higher than rat park at certain dosages. While the caged rats seemed happy to drift into their drugged haze, the rat park rats resisted. The freely available morphine went largely untouched within rat park, with the rats seemingly preferring a social life uninterrupted by the morphine's effects. Days 19 to 23, the researchers upped the sugar, and the caged rats slipped further into their narcosis. But still, the rat park rats avoided the freely available morphine. Rat park's consumption rose, but still remained a fraction of their isolated neighbours. Finally, Alexander's team tipped the sugar-drug ratio to the cocktail that none of the rats could resist. Days 24 to 28. The rats which had avoided the heavily drugged brews began drinking the sweet syrup with light narcotic content. The researchers were confident the rats had been avoiding the effects of the drug, not the taste. In a side experiment, the team found that the rat's aversion to morphine sugar water could be reversed by adding naltrexone to the liquid. The additive worked as an antidote to the morphine, counteracting the effects of the drugs, while sparing sugary taste. The rats would lap up the previously avoided drugs mixed spite with naltrexone learning that drinking would no longer dull their senses. Kicking the habit, another rat park experiment tested the addictive nature of opiates from the opposite direction. Rather than trying to tempt the rats into voluntary, voluntarily beginning morphine habits, the researchers deliberately made junkies out of the rats and then watched what would happen when given the choice again. The researchers were testing the withdrawal symptoms of drug dependence, a notion which suggests that the psychological effects of quitting opiate use is so unbearable that users cannot stop their drug habits. The researchers took 32 new rats, 10 in isolation and 22 in a rat park, and put them on fluid regime designed to produce physical tolerance and physical dependence in each and every rat. On most days, the rats were given no fluids besides drugged morphine water. The team punctuated the experiment with nine choice days, days where rats could choose between water or morphine water. Would the, hab would the habituated rats choose the water or the drugs? The results showed clear trends across the choice days. The isolated rats continued their morphine stupor and actually increased their intake over their choice days. The story across the room, however, in Rat Park was different. Though physically dependent on morphine, the Rat Park rats decreased their drug use on choice days. Withdrawal symptoms were noted in the twitchy rats, yet still, the Rat Park rats avoided the morphine. Both groups of rats were physically dependent on the morphine, yet behaved in two different ways. To Alexander and the team, the Rat Park rats were choosing to endure the morphine withdrawal symptoms. They were deliberately trying to return to a social life not disrupted by the drugs, a normal social life unavailable to the caged rats. Bruce Alexander and his colleagues ran multiple experiments within Rat Park. Together, the team swept their search beams across dark corners at the foundations of drug addiction theory, trying to corner and confront the evidence at the heart of the arguments to criminalise drug use. 
Trapped in the scrutinising glare of the researchers' spotlights, the basic fears behind drug prohibition arguments look a lot less scary. The Rat Park studies were part of a turning tide of evidence away from boogeyman tales and de- demonic drugs towards a more nuanced understanding of drugs and addiction. Professor Alexander noted three common threads from the Rat Park experiments. Number one, despite the addictive demon drug reputation of heroin, the researchers had to strongly coax the rats into taking drugs. Far from it being an irresistible poison, sugar force habituation and isolation were essential to make the rats want to drink the morphine. Two, given the chance to live in a normal society, with comfortable housing and a social contract, the rats living in Rat Park had little appetite for the opiate drugs. Three, Chemical addiction was not the strongest factor influencing the rat's habits. Rather than becoming identically spellbound by addiction, the rat's drug taking varied with physical, mental and social setting. The university cancelled the research funding in 1982. The plywood was sawed up into pieces, the rats were taken from their paradise, and the researchers found other projects. Bruce Alexander was wary of overgeneralizing the findings of Rat Park and making the same mistakes of the 1960s rat researchers who applied their self-injection findings to humans. Yet he remained haunted by the study's findings. What was it about Rat Park which allowed the residents to avoid addiction, despite drugs being readily available? And what was it about these cages which prompted the rats to lose themselves in drug consumption? Would humans need to be locked away in a cage to feel the same way? Or are there other types of isolation which might lead to addiction? Bruce Alexander's work moved beyond the world of rats, to the world of people, but was shadowed by the question lingering from the experiments of Rat Park. What if the difference between not being addicted and being addicted was the difference between seeing the world as your park and seeing the world as your cage? Thank you very much for watching. I hope you understand my feelings on addiction a bit better because this comic is the basis of my own thoughts and feelings on addiction. But thank you very much for watching. I've been Flippy. Check out Stuart McMillan's other work. Like I said, none of this is mine. I appreciate the work he's done with the comics so uh, to help me understand. But uh, I'll see you all in the next video. Have a good one.